I may have your attention to introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you. Hi. I've been really excited about introducing Robin Morgan to you tonight, and I sat down this afternoon and assigned myself the task of trying to memorize uh, the incredible accomplishments of Robin Morgan so that I could reel them off to you as, as though I knew them all by heart. I gave up the project both because it was beyond my ability and because I decided after meeting Robin Morgan and talking with her some this afternoon and at dinner this evening that she would be much more pleased if I would concentrate this energy on something of her own creative ability. So though it's not completely memorized, I decided I would like to share with you one of her poems which is particularly meaningful to me and that she herself is very fond of and then I will say a few things about Robin Morgan and her accomplishments. Um, the poem that I like very much is called The Invisible Woman. Uh, it says a lot to me about the position of woman in our culture. The invisible woman in the asylum corridor sees others quite clearly, including the doctor who patiently tells her she isn't invisible, and pities the doctor who must be mad to stand there in the asylum corridor talking and gesturing to nothing at all. The invisible woman has great compassion, so after a while she pulls on her body like a rumpled glove and switches on her voice to comfort the elated doctor with words. Better to suffer this prominence than for the poor doctor to learn he himself is insane. Only the strong can know that. Robin Morgan says, quote, I am committed to the worldwide feminist revolution and to the overthrow of the current patriarchy by any means necessary, end quote. She is a radical feminist militant who has been active in the women's movement since 1967. She's previously involved with the New Left, which she now refers to as the Boys Movement because she felt <laughs> that she found it to be what she calls, quote, the counterfeit left, end quote, and exited in disgust at the male supremacy she feels exists in the so-called New Left. In 1967, Robin Morgan founded the New York Radical Women, which was the first women's liberation group in New York City. In 1968, she organized the Miss America pageant protest, the first mass demonstration of the current wave of feminism in America. The same year, she founded WITCH, Women's International Terrorist Conspiracy from Hell, and in 1969, organized the nationwide protests against the exploitation of women in bridal fairs. In 1970, Robin Morgan compiled and edited Sisterhood is Powerful, the first comprehensive anthology of writings to come out of the women's movement. It has become a basic course text in most women's studies programs. She also established the Sisterhood is Powerful Fund, which channeled all the royalties from the anthology, plus a portion of the fees that she receives from lectures and from her books, back into the women's movement. As of 1974, approximately $40,000 had been distributed from this fund into feminist groups. In 1971, Robin Morgan served as guest professor at New College in Sarasota, Florida, where she established a feminist studies program there. She is best known to me as a writer, editor, and poet. Her articles have been frequently anthologized and have often appeared in mass circulation and underground periodicals. Uh, she has written for prominent places like the New York Times, and her poetry has appeared in, a hun in nearly a hundred literary journals, including the Yale Review, the Atlantic, the Feminist Art Journal. She has also published uh, a collection of poems entitled Monster, and I've seen several copies of this floating around on campus today, uh, published in 1972 by Random House. Robin Morgan has two books which she anticipates being published in the coming year, hopefully by spring. One is the second book of her poetry, which will be called The Network of the Imaginary Mother, and also a collection of prose, essays, and writings of her own, which she has done since 1967, and which she hopes will serve as a kind of 
of uh, depiction of the evolution of a feminist consciousness. And the book will be entitled Going Too Far. In addition, she is currently working on still another book to be called Tales of the Witches. These will be short stories which will basically be historical fiction and they are based upon research that Robin Morgan has done about witchery all the way back to the Middle Ages. So these are uh, a sort of sampling of the achievements and accomplishments of the woman that we are so excited to have as our keynote speaker for Women's Week at Iowa State. I'm really happy to introduce to you Robin Morgan. an awful lot. Gosh, I got really exhausted uh, hearing what I'd done. Uh, if, if, I, if I had paid attention to it when I was doing it, obviously I would have got exhausted at that point. Um, I'm really very glad to be here, and I feel just very excited tonight um, about Women's Week and about all that's planned uh, and about the Ames women that I've met since I arrived. Um, in fact, I, I really sort of want to start not only with my own welcome uh, to you, to Women's Week, but with a, with a gesture from me, which I hope you'll join me in, for the women who organized um, at an immense amount of work, time, dedication, commitment, and energy, what I think is going to be just something the like of which the school has never seen before, but will see again many times. They have been just beautiful and have put together one of the most superb and all-inclusive um, coverages of the women's movement and of concerns to women that I've ever seen, and I salute them, and I think they deserve a hand. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to rap about women as uh, creative beings and how we create ourselves in the process of uh, totally changing the planet. Um, in other words, a feminist revolution. And this is really nice because usually when I speak, uh, and more and more I've been doing poetry readings instead of speeches, but usually when I speak, uh, it kind of is like trying to sandwich the women's movement uh, into an hour. Um, very often to people who have heard very, very little about it or only media myths. And it's very frustrating because you sort of, you know, there's three minutes on rape and two minutes on medical care, a uh, minute and a half on lesbianism, uh, two minutes on motherhood, and it's maddening and it's very superficial and you feel like you're running against a clock. Well, um, fortunately, all of those issues will be gone into uh, in depth at the workshops, at the seminars, at the meetings. So I don't feel like I have to make a, a, a running leap across them superficially. Um, as was said earlier, uh, the, there will be workshops on rape and on um, self-help medicine uh, and on traditional politics and on art and on the participation of minority women in the women's movement, women in academia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that this is so valuable, not only for shared communication in terms of what's happening in these areas, but in fact for developing political analysis about these things. Rape, for example, from a radical feminist perspective, is in no way, shape, or means an act of sexuality. It is an act of political terrorism deliberately designed by the patriarchy to keep women in our place. And it is one for which the victim, of course, is always blamed. Um, the self-help uh, medical groups, to me, are one of the cutting edges of the women's movement because I make the analogy of women uh, with colonized peoples. In our case, the colony is our own body. It has been taken from us. It has been mined. Uh, for its natural resources, uh, childbirth, uh, sex, and in the process we become alienated from it. And the first thing that a colonized people does is reclaim the land. Uh, the self-help clinics uh, are doing unbelievably beautiful work in that very area, but you'll have a self-help presentation, so I need to go into that in detail. So what I am going to do instead is, is sort of two things. One, I'll try to share with you a general view of what has been happening 
in the women's movement since about 1968, um, an arbitrary time to begin, but one could peg that as a good time because it was the time of the first mass demonstration, the, the first demonstration of the Miss America pageant. Uh, on up through now in terms of sort of trends and developments and growth and where we were at different stages. And s secondly, uh, a little later on, I'd love to talk a bit about um, fragments emerging of what one could call the feminist vision. Not that there are not many feminist visions, but in a sense they, they coalesce into a whole. Um, to backtrack to the, the sort of current history of the women's movement, in 1968 at Atlantic City, uh, there were 200 of us who decided we were going to take on the pageant. Um, it's strange because in putting together the book of essays that Carol mentioned, um, I came across a, an article that I'd written about, you know, those of us who had organized the pageant and the way in which we'd organized the pageant. And um, in it I said there were 200 of us on the boardwalk um, eventually, of course, no one will need to be there because out of sheer tackiness alone, the pageant will just dissolve. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I mean, never mind that it's sexist, it's also just so boring and ticky-tacky and vulgar and blah. Um, but, but I went on to say that until that time happens, perhaps the day would come when uh, 2,000 women would be uh, on the boardwalk. Now, the day that I came across that particular article, which had been published in 1968, that same day in the New York Times, uh, there was coverage of the fact that um, 2,500 women had demonstrated uh, on the boardwalk outside the Miss America pageant. And it was a peculiar, wonderful feeling that uh, the prophecies that we make sometimes in a delirium of will uh, become true, and I think that's very much a part of the process of creating ourselves. That phase was basically the educative phase. There was, it seemed, one goal, which was to get the word out that we existed. Um, there was such a thing as the Women's Liberation Movement. Um, that's W-O-E-M-E-R. -E uh, and the, I must say that the pageant demonstration sort of put that movement, in a sense, on the map. Although, with being on the map came all the delightful media fun things that went with it, um, and, and the ridicule, um, and the backlash that went with it. On the other hand, and far more important, um, women knew that they were not alone anymore. Uh, you know, a woman a thousand miles away seeing that blurb on the six o'clock news could think, maybe I'm not crazy after all. And that was one beginning. Not that the educative phase ever really ends, but, or any of these phases that I'll talk about, but it's just that they sort of grow and evolve and become layered onto with other phases. It seems that in the ensuing years, as the movement grew bigger and bigger, uh, as any mass broad-based movement will, um, there was a wide spectrum of political tactics, goals, strategies, uh, styles. This I see. Um, as a virtue, as a strength, uh, as a kind of unity in diversity. But it's also scary because, uh, you know, patriarchal thinking is very prone to sameness and we all have that thinking in our brains and if everybody is doing the same thing at exactly the moment then we know we're safe. Um, so that there came a whole struggle period over what were in, and are important and very serious um, divisions between women. Although all of those divisions are patriarchally created divisions, uh, since women have not had the power to create them. In other words, they have been imposed by um, a male structure. I'm talking about divisions of race, class, age, sexual preference, um, mothers or non-mothers, those kinds of differences. Economic differences, geographical differences. Um, they are very real, and they, it is very important that they be realized, that they be brought out into the open, that they be talked about, and that they be struggled over. And those next few years, 69, 70, 71, and still ongoing, since we haven't solved uh, all the problems yet, um, I think we're very constructive and will continue to be. Sometimes um, it turns into factionalism. Sometimes it turns into bitterness. That's normal, too. Yet there seems to be a survival spirit that carries us through and which is unlike any political movement that I have ever known. Um, 
Those were also the years of an emerging and definitive split from the left, what I used to call the new left, what I then um, called the male left, and what I now refer to as the boys' movement. Uh, we were the women, of course, in the student movement, civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the ecology movement, the peace movement, and all those other movements who got bursitis from the cranking of the mimeograph machines. And, um, <laughs> wiped the tear gas from our eyes and went and made supper while he wiped the tear gas from his eyes and went and lay down um, and made the coffee, not the policy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And after a while, you know, this does begin to get to you. Um, and so there was this sort of trickle out of the left, which became a tidal wave. It's always interesting to me when I read a national magazine now that will say, what has become of the left? And they have all these elaborate theories of what has become of it. It's perfectly simple to me what has become of the left, as long as there are no longer any women there to do the drudgery work the left collapse. <laughs> it's, not, it's not that... Um, it's not that in the split with the left, however, as would be superficially perhaps seen, uh, women moved backward. Quite the contrary. Um, we moved forward, and we moved into a frame of thought and political action far more radical than anything that nice old liberal Marx had yet been able to come up with. Um, because I really do think that what lies at the heart of every society um, is, in fact, the emotional and sexual relations between the sexes. This, we know, is the oldest oppression on the face of the earth. Uh, the oppression of women has, is the model for all other oppressions. It was the first. Uh, and once that concept of alienizing half the human population, now more than half women, the majority, once that concept got started of the other, it was, of course, a tragic and inevitable and ghastly um, process that uh, it was then possible to view other people as the other, someone of a different height or weight or skin color or language. So that from that root grew the agonies of racism, of imperialism, of capitalism, of ecological ruin, uh, and all of the other things which progressive peoples have been hacking away at for years and which always seem to grow back in one way or another because we don't get to the root. Um, to me, for example, um, various prefixes to feminism, which sometimes occur, such as, say, socialist feminist or something like that, seem unnecessary and redundant because inherent within feminism, uh, to me, is the most profound and far-reaching change that has yet been conceived of for the human species. I am speaking of a total revolution in every sense of that term, a complete social, economic, gender, cultural, political, structural, uh, biological, and in fact, metaphysical revolution. Um, I'm not talking about equality, and I must warn you that. Uh, I don't really want to be equal with what it is men are and do, given the status quo. I want to change that, too. Uh, so I am talking about power for women, power in terms of self-determination, power in terms not of power over, but power as in an energy released by a power plant, that kind of power. We need new words for these concepts. We're creating them. Anyway, that, um, that, that period sort of um, uh, moved us away from the, the guilt and the um, service jobs uh, that we had done in the left, as we had done it in the right, and we've done it in the middle, and we've done it all over the place. Um, maybe this is a, a good spot to... Um, detour for a moment and talk about men. Might as well get that one out of the way. Uh, it's, it's been a, a carefully built and um, fostered um, set of cliches about what feminists do or do not think about men, as if in the first place there was one massive, monolithic, 12-foot-tall, two-headed, horned, fire-breathing thing called a feminist. Um, now, we're working toward becoming her, <laughs> but we ain't yet. Um, so that I think it's important to clear up terminology about things like man-haters, for example. Um, every oppressed group which 
begins to think seriously about its oppression, let alone move against it, realizes that there is an enormous volume of buried and utterly justifiable rage. Um, one could say that there are two classes. Um, it's a class analysis. It ought to make Marxists very happy. Um, but what I'm talking about is a class of men and a class of women. When I speak of patriarchy and male supremacy, I'm talking very concretely about those who hold power in a society, who are almost always white, heterosexual males, usually elderly and frequently very wealthy. Um, Rockefeller, for example, there's a definition of a human being. Hmm? Anyone else who is not um, white, male, heterosexual, and wealthy, and straight, is a non-human being. And if you happen to be all those things combined, you have real problems. Uh, all right, when I'm speaking about the kind of power that is held in a patriarchy, I'm not speaking abstractly. I'm saying that legislatures, education, the media, religion, every aspect of our lives, all those power reigns which define and control the way that life is lived in our culture are in the hands of males. Um, that's what I mean by patriarchy. In terms of that class division, I think it is an honorable and justifiable um, thing for the oppressed to hate the class that oppresses them. That does not mean um, that there are not class traitors in that oppressive class. That does not mean that there are not in the class of whites, whites who are not struggling sincerely and dedicatedly with a lifelong commitment against our own racism. But it also means that there are whites who will uphold that class. That doesn't mean that there are not men who are struggling sincerely against sexism, but it also means that there will be class upholders. So in terms of being man-haters, uh, I think it's time that the word, the phrase was dusted off and looked at no longer with shame or explanation. I think it is a right of an oppressed people to hate the class which has tried to destroy them. And we better admit it. Um, what will happen with men? What will, um, what we, will we do with men in this feminist revolution, as is often yay asked? Um, I don't know. I mean, I certainly have my bad days when I think in terms of androcide, but that's not usual. Um, obviously, it's an, I would give an answer very similar to what um, black radicals in the 60s said when liberal whites came along and rang their our hands and said, you know, well, well, well what is it? does black power mean you're going to do to us what we did to you? Because that's really what the secret question is. When the oppressed get power, the oppressor are afraid they're going to use that power the way the oppressors use that power against the oppressed, if you follow. Um, and the reply was, that's really going to depend on you. Um, move on over, or we'll move on over you. You remember that phrase? Well, clearly, um, no woman I have ever known is into gratuitous violence or gratuitous hatred, partly perhaps because of conditioning, partly perhaps because uh, of differences that we don't yet really understand because there's been no unbiased research. In any event, it doesn't seem to be our style. That doesn't mean that we can't get very angry and move when we have to move. However, uh, nobody's itching for that to happen. So it does depend a great deal on what men do. Um, one would hope, uh, particularly those of us who, say, have male children, that men can and will change uh, for their own sake and most decidedly for ours uh, and for the planet's sake. Um, sexism brutalizes men just like racism is rotten for the brains of whites. But it is not comparative to what sexism does to women, to what racism does to blacks. That's oppression. Um, so that the priority, of course, for us is each other as women because the change, we are the motor. The change will come from there. Uh, while there will be individual men who will struggle to change, the vast majority of men, I fear, realistically speaking, will change only when they have to. And that means a strong, or autonomous, global women's movement. Um, so it's really up to the men. To get back to our progression, um, as people were struggling over all of those interrelated issues and where the differences uh, existed and where they overlapped and uh, what, what was the glue that somehow kept us together despite all those other differences? What was the similarity of experience, the, the, the pulse of the women's movement that existed and exists and will exist in consciousness racing groups, the, uh, the notion that the personal is political? Um, that, while that continued, we began to build 
alternative institutions. We began to have our own feminist media, newspapers, magazines, um, videotape groups, uh, theater groups, rock bands, um, classical music groups, books, records, on and on. And this was very important because we began to have some kind of taste that we were creating a culture. That wasn't the only kind of institution, though, that we were creating. Um, the, the clinics, the legal clinics, um, the self-help medical clinics, which were not fly-by-night things, although the man always kept sitting back and saying, it's a fad, it'll pass, it'll pass. He's been saying this now for seven years about this phase of the women's movement. That's not even dealing with the 19th century suffrage movement. It, he says, devoutly wishing, will pass. Uh, those institutions are going to be around for a long time. In Los Angeles, um, the Feminist Women's Health Clinic is now so shopping around for its first hospital, uh, which they intend then to expand into a medical school and a research center, and for the first feminist medical center. Knowing those women, they're going to do it. They're already doing research in sickle cell anemia, which destroys our black sisters and their children, in Tay-Sachs disease, which destroys Jewish women and their children. Um, and in all areas uh, of gynecology, um, menstrual extraction, um, fantastic and revolutionary things. The kind of research you tend not to get the AMA endorsing. <laughs> um, <laughs> at the same time that all of this exterior activity uh, began to mushroom, profound changes were going on, of course, within us, and they continue to go on. Um, and nobody ever has a perfect consciousness or a heightened one. As soon as you think that you really are the complete feminist, you, your skull sort of bumps against the ceiling, uh, and then the ceiling opens up, and there's another ceiling. Um, the kinds of changes we were going through, I think, um, were mainly in terms of redefining ourselves. We've begun to glimpse the profound and far-reaching ways in which women were defined by men in our culture. Um, not only in terms of how we lived, where we lived, the kinds of jobs, all the obvious things, but in deep and subtle areas, um, certainly in our sexuality. And with that questioning came a whole new flowering um, of consciousness. So that you begin to have um, heterosexual women now uh, picking up the cudgels of struggle, real struggle, with the men with whom they are involved. You have had and will continue to have a veritable explosion of proud, affirmative consciousness in lesbian love. You have had an explosion of um, consciousness in terms of the rights of the celibate woman. Sometimes I think that um, even despite the intense and vicious bigotry of this patriarchal culture against homosexuality, sometimes I think that they'll even manage to accept homosexuality first before they'll accept celibacy. It's almost as if, well, we would prefer if you were doing it with someone of the opposite sex, but the important thing is that you're doing it. <laughs> Valerie Solanus once said that our culture was in danger of humping itself to death, and I... <laughs> um, the consciousness of bisexuality, the opening up of options, mainly. Um, and most important to me, the reconnecting of sex and love. There was a period, of course, when, for centuries, when we have been laughed at, you know, for um, mixing up sex and love. Um, you know, you have to tell a woman that you love her in order to. And then along came the uh, sexual revolution, which never occurred for women, it only occurred for men. During the sexual revolution, um, if a woman did not want to leapfrog from one bed into another, um, if she wanted an emotional attachment, no one would any longer even bother to lie to her and say, yes, I love you. Um, instead, they would say, what, are you crazy? You're uptight, you're prudish. Um, and in the hip left alternative culture, where they always addressed women as, hey, man, they would say, oh, hey, man, you give me bad vibes. Um, and the pill which not only gave us blood clots, also, also took away one of the main um, excuses, because at least up until that point, maybe you could sort of say, well, I'm afraid of getting pregnant. Maybe he'd leave you alone. Now, it became more difficult, because the most unacceptable answer of all was the honest one, which might be, I just don't feel like it, or I just don't want to have sex with anyone at all, or 
I wouldn't mind having sex, but frankly, I think you're yucky. <laughs> well, out of that, out of that, we began to reconnect um, the concepts of emotional warmth, of love, of commitment, and sexuality, and begin, in fact, to wonder how they ever had got disconnected for us, why we had ever been made to feel ashamed of them. I mean, we know why. There was a lot of pressure. But we were told we were crazy for wanting that connection. And, and now um, it is just such an extraordinary um, freeing idea and beginning to be reality that women are saying, not only is that not crazy, to want to like, to want to be involved in, perhaps to want commitment to, with, and from the person that you're going to go to bed with, but in fact, that is eminently sane. That has always been women's sexuality, and in fact, it's wonderful. Uh, that, I think, came out of the process of redefinition. It's not easy, it's not a simple process. All of the processes in fact, were intensely complex and circuitous, and they go on, and they become, in fact, more complex. But meanwhile, whole vast areas of pain, because that's what oppression always comes down to, when the rhetoric is swept aside, uh, when the organizing is swept aside, even, um, even if the, quote, revolution is won, what has been the issue all along is human agony and anguish. Um, we have not lost our sense of humor, as we're often accused of. We've lost it about jokes being directed at us. Uh, but we actually have a marvelous sense of humor. If we didn't, we would all just crack up and been in the booby hatch a long time ago. However, we keep that sense of humor going in the face of our own daily anguish as women, black, white, young, old, lesbian, heterosexual, celibate, high school, grandmother, um, and what each day this culture does to destroy our spirit and our bodies and our lives and our babies and our sisters and each other, and in fact our men because of patriarchy. Um, around about, I guess, 69, and then really beginning to burst forth in 70, came women's studies. And at first a few token courses here and there, and then whole programs. Um, you could major or minor in it. You could even begin to get a graduate degree in women's studies. Uh, I gather that there are sisters, in fact, here on this campus who are working toward a women's studies program. I hope that's talked about more during this week, and I hope that sisters in the audience will give them support um, to help that program get started, because it really is sad that a university this large does not have a full women's studies program. With women's studies came an opening up of our history. Uh, like that of other oppressed peoples, our history has been taken from us. It's been buried. It's never a coincidence. Very, very few um, people in this country know that the first open heart surgery in the world was done in this country by a black male surgeon. Similarly, very few people uh, ha happen to know who Stanton and Anthony really were. Um, the word that goes out is, you write them out of the history books or you depict them in a ridiculous fashion. And then when they rise up again 50 years from now, you'll tell them, but there's no precedent for this. Um, I mean, your people were always happy on the plantation. And then finally you have to go back and discover the Nat Turners and the Margaret Fullers. Uh, and then you see, aha, all along we were fighting. We were crushed and then we were erased, but we were there. It's very hard to build on a vacuum, on a void. And so the discovery of our own past for any oppressed people is vital. With the discovery of that history comes whole new possibilities for political analyses, too, um, and for action. In terms of political analyses, I'm talking about the kinds of research that's being done into the ancient gynocratic and matriarchal cultures, how they were structured, um, what we can learn from them, what we can apply from them, um, the ancient matriarchal religions before the patriarchy arose who the witches really were, that they were midwives, the first midwives, that they were primitive healers, that they were revolutionaries who fought on the side of the serfs against the landlords, and that they were worshipers of the old religion that, that worshiped the tripartite goddess, virgin mother and crone. All of these things have a profound cultural effect. They also, um, women's studies and the whole notion of women beginning to really 
vibrate um, with our own uh, felt power in academic situations has very practical effects in the very real world, too. Um, we are beginning to unlearn the trip that was laid on us, especially by white male radicals, which was the um, downward mobility, ultra-egalitarian, pro-ignorance, anti-intellectualism, drop out of school, and mainly stir brown rice trip. Um, we are, we're beginning to unlearn guilt about those things. We know how desperately um, we need each other in schools. We know that the man has the tools right now and that you can't seize power abstractly. It isn't out there sort of like a chunk of ectoplasm. If, for example, it is important to us, as it is vital, that women control our own reproductive technology, what are we going to do when we march into those laboratories um, and say, what's that, a test tube? Um, we need women in science. We need women in technology as much as we need women in the humanities and in every conceivable area. I think there's going to be a difference because women now who will go into those areas will not go in as the token women um, of 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, the exceptional woman who uh, was permitted to be there at the sufferance of the men and who was so grateful for that that she usually turned around and kicked her sisters in the teeth. She wanted to be the token. Instead, um, these are women who are going to law school and medical school and on and on, not to hang out fancy shingles and be a, you know, a token lady doctor or lawyer. They're coming out with those skills. They're teaching those skills to other women. They're setting up alternative institutions, the law clinics, the medical clinics. They're sharing that knowledge with their own community and with all people. And that's a very different way of functioning um, and a very powerful way. In the very last year, um, I think perhaps the most important single development since the, at least since 68, our arbitrary starting date, which is the visible blossoming, because it obviously has existed long before its visibility, of intense and militant and beautiful feminist consciousness among black women and third world women in general. Last autumn, the existence of a national black feminist organization being born. Um, the Chicana Feminist Federation in the Southwest, the Native American feminist groups in the Southwest, the Hawaiian feminist groups, the Puerto Rican feminist alliance, all over the country. Um, I think that, you know, patriarchy is a very all-pervasive thing. Uh, and obviously, there was male supremacy in the black left like there was in the white left. There certainly was in the civil rights days. There has been, in fact, in every movement and in every non-movement. It is the way of our culture. And for a very long while, um, the trip was laid on the black feminist that she shouldn't be a feminist because black manhood came first. As Margaret Sloan has said, this is very strange. I feel like I'm suddenly being asked to go again to the back of the bus. Uh, feminism has not, nor ever would be, uh, a white woman's trip. It is a trip for all women, and in fact, for all men who have more than two brain cells to rub together. Um, it is, in other words, uh, something that, that is not based on some women gaining privilege at the expense of others or a few more women at the top. It's, we're talking about totally changing the society as a whole at its roots in a ripple effect. In the past year also, there's been a lot of housewives pouring into the women's movement. I think, for example, that the housewives meat boycott of a year ago would have been impossible five years before. Now, it was not uh, stated as a feminist action. But what I'm saying is that without the existence of the feminist movement, the notion of women nationwide banding together to pack that kind of economic clout would not have been thought possible. So it is one of the ripple effects. Um, a lot of high school women making waves. A lot of nuns really turning the church on its ear. Uh, uppity sisters. Um, <laughs> the political caucus in the civil rights part of the women's movement doing extremely valuable work uh, in campaigning with and from and supporting women candidates and taking that route. As a radical feminist, that is not my route, but I support and I respect the work that they're doing. Um, I hope that we can complement each other. In the way, for example, like the Miss America pageant, because those 200 of us in 68 were 
crazy screaming radical harpy feminists. And a lot of women in the New York chapter of the National Organization for Women were very upset. But the 2,500 women who were demonstrating there last month were women from the tri-state area convention of NOW. Um, so things do evolve. What's happened, I think, now is that we are digging in for the long term. We have begun to throw over what I would call the male-style ejaculatory tactics of the left. <laughs> um, you know, that kind of thing where with that you don't really have a sort of ongoing feeling for each other and for your own people and, uh, and, or a really solid political analysis, let alone one that can change and grow. So you sort of take an issue as it comes and everybody out into the streets, it's rent a riot, you know. And that is not <laughs> what I'm talking about. Um, by the long-term effect, I'm saying that, that we're going the whole way. We can't afford, in fact, to lose this one. The planet is in such ecological trauma. Um, and everything is coming to such a vertical curve peak now that this time we go all the way. Or the species will not exist, in which case none of us will have to worry anyway. So we have nothing to lose. Um, the digging in, I think, permits us not slackness, but a combination of the urgency we have felt all along, which is born of pain, daily, and daily reinforced pain, combined with a patience to see something through. Um, a feminist hospital is not something that will come and go overnight. Uh, seeing ahead, not again making a revolution for our children, not falling into that trap, which women have been forced into a lot of times, for ourselves, but also knowing that we're up against 12,000 years of patri patriarchy and that Rome was not unmade in a day. Okay, that, that attitude begins then to let us think about other aspects of feminism which, which in a sense lie at the heart of all the activity which we've been talking about. And this is the second thing that I want to talk about. Um, they, I remember when I was an adolescent, I was told, you know, the three things it's impolite to talk about are sex, politics, and religion. Well, I've now talked about sex and politics, and I'm going to take on religion. Um, I don't mean by that the pornographic obscenity of the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, most notably evinced uh, in the Roman Catholic Church, which has on its hands the blood not only of nine million women who were burned as witches during the Middle Ages, but today, the women of Latin and South America, where the highest cause of death among women is abortion and the next highest cause is childbirth in solid Catholic countries. Um, not only that church, although I must admit it's a tempting um, metaphor for all of patriarchy. I mean, it is, after all, an octogenarian celibate hierarchy of males who are running around in drag while ruling the lives of women. I'm not talking solely about that. I'm not even talking solely about the Judeo-Christian tradition, which has basically read out one word to women, unclean. Um, I'm talking about patriarchal religions in general. As you might imagine, um, I have quite a few choice words to say about Islam. I'm not terribly fond of the Mormons. My own uh, background, which is Jewish uh, has really done its number on women, and I'm so I want, you know, I don't want to play favorites here, so I want it perfectly clear that it is patriarchal religion that I'm talking about, and what that has done to us not only in our real lives, like the burning, like the massacres and butcher abort abortion tables, but what that has done to our view of the universe and ourselves. What I mean our is the individual woman's women right to name herself in the and, in fact, to name what she sees in the universe. Because when um, all is said and done about the factual and real day-to-day -day activities of the women's movement, that is where the core of non-identification comes in any oppressed person. It is that what has been taken from us, be we women, be we blacks, be we poor whites, be we Chicanas, whatever, is the power to name. And when we begin to name ourselves, um, there is no stopping us. 
Mary Daly, I'm in an extraordinarily brilliant book called more. Beyond God the Father, because has said a, a says a line which I really um, think about a lot. She says, women at this point in history are uniquely the bearers of existential courage. Because for us, there are really no models. We can learn a little bit from the matriarchies. We can learn a lot from what we feel. We can learn a lot from each other. But what we're really doing is stepping out into a place where no one has ever been before. Uh, that is terrifying. If we stand in an existential situation, then it follows that we know um, fear and trembling and that we know sickness unto death. And in those moments, sometimes it's very comforting to want to retreat to a, a correct line or want to try to drop out um, or want to try to not be active. But the brain still is pounding and the lights are still flashing on and off and the neon signs saying chick and the commercials are still degrading and the rapists are still after her and the husband is still out understanding her and her lesbian lover is taken away from her and her children are distorted in schools and she is robbed of her mother right and the pain remains. Um, what to do about that pain? Where to center it? Uh, for me, I have begun to think about um, what for want of a better word I'm calling metaphysical feminism. By which I mean that where feminism once seemed an arm, a wing, a leg, or a toe of the movement, by which I meant the boys' movement, then later on it became, in fact, the only rational, sane way in which I could view all politics. Now it does tend to sort of grow like yeast, and it is now the way in which I am beginning, in fact, to view, and I say this at some risk, um, the cosmos. Uh, I don't mean that in a superficial way. Uh, I'm not talking about an ERA of the galaxy. Um, I'm talking about it, in fact, in terms of a feminist philosophy, in terms of the courage, as Mary would put it, Mary Daly, to be, in terms of seeing creation as, in some very inherent way, innately female, um, of seeing that the female in the male has been, by patriarchal culture, stamped out or at least forced into hiding, of beginning to see that thing as a life force. This doesn't mean that I'm talking about an anthropomorphical uh, uh, mother goddess, um, which I love to talk about, but it doesn't mean that I'm saying that that replaces some old man up in the sky with a white beard. Um, it does mean perhaps that we get in touch with the divinity in each of us. The same way that a woman who looks at herself for the first time with a speculum and a mirror uh, after having thought intellectually that of course her body was fine and clean and right, but feeling emotionally that it was as everything had told her unclean. And she looks uh, at her cervix and she sees the great craft and beauty and cleanliness and holiness of her own body. And a connection is made between her brain and her body that will never again be severed. That kind of divinity, that kind of passion, that kind of endurance is necessary. If we cannot glimpse what it is we are fighting for, we'll never win it. Um, this is perhaps the best job um, that, that poets um, and philosophers can do, but if it is something that only poets and philosophers do, we have also lost because we are part of each other in a worldwide global movement now, stretching from Tanzania to Peking, all through Europe, Australia, Canada, South America, all across the United States, all up and down the Gold Coast of Africa, of women who have said 12,000 years is enough the people cry out in great pain. It is not funny. It is not cute. It must end. We are more than half the human population. We have been oppressed longer than any other, and we will stand it no more. We will also fight it in ways that have not yet been conceived. Because by any means necessary to me doesn't only mean what it meant in the left, which was Mark Rudd sort of trying to out machismo J. Edgar Hoover, 
Um, it means self-defense and defense of each other, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. It means defending our children from being taken from us physically or their brains being sucked out by the patriarchy. Uh, it means, and this I say at an even greater risk, a revolution of profound love, and not love in any way that women have been considered to love by men, but a way in which we are only beginning to discover out of ourselves. It's like the spider, uh, who is seen, of course, as a uh, horrific kind of female stereotype. She spins out from herself um, the web. She spins out from herself the, as, as does the silkworm, um, the very material in which she lives uh, and on which she can survive. And she also does that not only for survival, but she does it in a beautiful pattern. She does it in a mandala. She does it with style. I see the possibility for the combination of use and beauty here that I have never seen in any other political movement. Just the way that women's art, which you will be talking about later this week, combines that in a unique way. Patriarchal male art uh, has tended to say that if something is also of use, it's not art, it's a craft, and you sort of shunt it aside. This means, of course, that the great Native American art, which uh, was mostly done in pottery and weaving by women, is seen as a craft because Although it was exquisitely beautiful, it was also something to drink from, or it was a blanket to keep someone warm. Um, the whole heritage of American music, which comes from black culture, those songs were not only great works of art, but they were also work songs. They were lullabies. They were to make the work be more tolerable, go faster to survive it. Quilting and the genius designs that we now are discovering existed um, in 18th and 19th century quilts, the same thing. And they also were to keep people warm. That combination always, that where the patriarchy has settled, separated out, we combine and combine and combine. I want to close um, with a short poem, which is very new, only a few days old, and which I thought that I would read tonight. Um, because it also has to do with making ourselves and making each other and that mutual creation. Last Thursday, Anne Sexton, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet, killed herself at the age of 45. She had been a friend of Sylvia Plath's. They had often talked about suicide. They had often talked about the agonies of the woman poet. Um, Sexton outlasted Plath by about 12 years, uh, but not long enough. She was not a feminist. She was very afraid of feminism. We all have our defenses. Sooner or later, they wear down if we last long enough for them to. Her poems show the feminist consciousness, but she hadn't yet got up the courage to make the connection, to make the identification, and to admit what her poems already said. She was found in her garage, in the garage of her home in Massachusetts with the car motor running, asphyxiated. The following day, I wrote this poem uh, as a feminist, as a woman, as a woman poet. Certainly poets in our culture have not had an easy time of it in general. Um, artists tend not to have an easy time of it in general. Uh, I think art is seen by the patriarchy as effeminate, uh, womanly, and therefore to be highly suspect. For women artists in general, uh, it is a double agony, because they get it not only from the culture out there, but they get it from the male artists. It is a contradiction in terms, and one is always struggling an, up, an uphill route. Still, in the face of that, there's a whole renaissance of women's art, women's poetry, women's painting, <coughs> women's films. This is a poem about that, um, and about what we grieve for while we go on. It's called The Occupational Hazard. In memoriam, Anne Sexton, dead at 45, October 1974. We tick her off as the latest sacrifice, another in our long list who found the ultimate metaphor for being a woman poet in the imagery of the male. We must not be over-emotional about this. 
We recall the critics wincing slightly at her confessional style, but giving her some of the prizes still because she wasn't a feminist and knew several of the right men. Not that other men of that generation, Berriman, Gerald, Schwartz, didn't succumb to the same end for different reasons. It's just that women poets win, statistically that is, on this one issue. Suicide for us being an expected accomplishment, like playing a mean lute used to be. And we, the so far survivors, hone our hard corners, our angular selves, nesting empty inside one another like Chinese boxes, never utterly empty, in that we contain the hopes of each other, whether we know this or not. Usually, this is the one thing we have been kept from knowing, precisely. So that she who eventually sees only herself reflected in the polished shield of male poetry, the gorgon head, simile hissing, unruly from impermanent locks, adopts a stony gaze. After all, suicide is not in the world's view, to be sure, but in her own at present, the sole sure way, finally, to transcend all gender. We, the so far survivors, tell each other all the time, look, we are creating new ways. <coughs> Meanwhile, we mourn each latest casualty, quietly weeping, mm. as women will do. We who are about to try salute you. Thank you. Um, I, want, I, I should start by um, making an announcement which I always make at this point and which I always explain at this point. Um, it is simply that I don't take questions from men. I haven't in a long time. Um, and the reason for that, uh, there are political reasons for that. There are quite a few of them, but among those are the following. Um, first of all, there's not a woman alive, I would very much doubt there's a woman in this room, who has not sat in a class or a meeting or something comparable, and either raised her hand 40 times and felt like the invisible woman, or finally been called on and come up with you know, some really quite pithy statement, only to be totally ignored, am I really here, by the male instructor, who a few moments later will call on a guy who will say basically the same thing, and he'll say, good thinking, Jim. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and you begin to get this sort of d d double take feeling. Um, so it's nice to, I think, reverse that situation. I think that it's very important uh, that we talk to and from and with each other as the priority and learn from each other. I think it's also important for us to have a taste of power because it is um, a heady sensation. I think it's important for women in this room to know that they control the situation, that they will not be interrupted, that they um, uh, dominate the situation and can talk for as long or as short as they wish to. Uh, that it is their space, emotional, physical, intellectual space. Um, I think it's also important for the men because, after all, um, frequently one gets even the most well-intentioned male um, who feels that because he is so well-intentioned, he then has a right one to question a feminist ceaselessly, meanwhile his wife is off in the kitchen doing dishes. Or in a public forum situation, uh, he will do that 
even unconsciously not aware of the male privilege that just automatically attaches to him in a male supremacist society. Um, I think it's important that men learn to listen uh, and learn from that. It sometimes scares men. It often makes them very angry. These are the moments when one is making this very announcement when you never know whether there's going to be a bullet lodged in the podium, as once there was, or whether those great bastions of the jock mentality will rush the stage, as they have done. Um, so it's always a little iffy moment. Um, on the other hand, uh, I grant that there is a certain humiliation and even uh, confusion and pain involved in that. Once a man stood up and, um, and said, interrupting, and said, but, but, and he was crying. He said, but I try, I struggle all the time, and you, aren't you doing the same thing then back to us? I mean, I, I, I have sat here and I've listened and listened and listened and tried to learn, but I'm a human being too, and I have meaningful questions to me that I want answered, and I'm a human being too, and I find this unbearable. And um, I found that I began to cry too, because what he said was so familiar. And, and I said back to him, I understand what you're feeling. Um, I know that it's unbearable. But could you imagine for a moment that what you are going through uh, for what, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour at the most, which you find so intolerable for that space of time, is what every woman in this room goes through every minute of her entire life. If she can bear it, you can for a few moments. There's a last and very selfish reason why I do this, and it would be dishonest of me not to admit it. Uh, I have to tell you that although um, once in a while I'm sure there would be a serious and intelligent struggle-oriented question from a man, most of the time, in my experience, back when I was taking questions from men, most of the time the questions seem to come from an intellectual level that hovered dangerously near that of a sort of Neanderthal little gnat. And um, there are just so many times, you know, you can explain what it is we people want. Um, so, consequently, the floor is open to sisters um, for statements, arguments, questions, and also announcements. Um, if there are sisters who want to make announcements about things during, about, during Women's Week or extracurricular things hovering around Women's Week or sisters from other Iowa cities or wherever, please do make the announcements, too. So, who am looking? Yes, sorry. To what the second part of it? Do I have what um, form might do this might take as, as women begin to live in that form? Uh huh. I, I, no, I don't. I mean, I have for myself. It's very subjective, um, and I don't want to impose that on anybody else. I I can share it with you, um, uh, but I don't know that necessarily that will be what you know uh, other women will be into. I mean, I myself am very interested in in the old matriarchal religions. Uh, they were not um, in any way really comparable to the patriarchal ones. I mean, although they were, quote, goddess-worshipping religions, that is a misnomer because it, it, it was more a philosophy. It was a way of life. It um, was something that, you know, you didn't go to church on Sunday and then go out and gouge the rest of the week kind of thing. That, that compartmentalization, again, that you find in the patriarchy so much. In the matriarchal cultures, for example, no weaponry has been found in the graves. Um, they, it appears, were vegetarian people, um, uh, were unwarlike, um, that the basic relationship model for the whole society, since the creatrix was seen as a female force, the basic model then for all ways in which people related to each other was that of the mother and child. Now, of course, this was not the mother and child as that relationship has been distorted by the patriarchy, where sometimes, because we have no real power in any other area, sometimes we really get power over our children and really use that in negative ways. And it's understandable why that happens, but it's tragic. Th I'm not talking about that. This was, I'm talking about the interdependency between, let's say, the mother and the child, um, and, uh, and the reliance and the nurturing and the, the intuitive way in which a mother discovers that, you know, like she knows when the baby's going to be hungry two or three seconds before the baby cries. That developed, can you imagine, among all of us about each other. 
Uh, I have a child, and when I think of being able to live, which I will never live to do, but of living in a culture where 